to start with Dr. Pilar, who is going to tell us a lot, I think, about terrorism, because, uh, as I've said before, I think he is one of the great authorities, and if you haven't read his book, you should. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committees. I appreciate this invitation to testify in this uh, hearing on lessons from past U.S. experiences in confronting, US, uh, confronting international terrorism. And uh, I commend the committees for holding a hearing with this particular focus, reducing the chances of terrorist strikes against our nation's interests requires examination not only of a single incident, however tragic and traumatic that is, but also understanding what has and has not been tried in the past, what changes in our approach have already taken place, and what possibilities and limits have already been demonstrated. One lesson from the past is that the principal characteristics of the terrorist threat we face today and the challenges for intelligence that those characteristics pose have been with us for quite some time. The difficulties that the September 11th case presented to intelligence, and to law enforcement for that matter, were all too typical of what we have repeatedly faced in the past. Terrorist groups, or more specifically, the parts of them that do the planning and the preparation for terrorist attacks are small, highly secretive, suspicious of outsiders, highly conscious of operational security, and for those and other reasons, extremely difficult to penetrate. The collection challenges go even further. The intelligence target is not just a fixed set of targets. It is anyone, even if not a card-carrying member of al-Qaeda or some other known terrorist group, and even if the person has not been involved in terrorist activity in the past, but anyone who may use terrorist techniques to inflict harm on U.S. interests. Along with the collection challenges are the analytic ones. The material that counterterrorist analysts have had to work with has always consisted of voluminous but fragmentary and ambiguous reporting, much of it of doubtful credibility, that provides only the barest and blurriest glimpses of possible terrorist activity. The analysts have long been faced with blizzards of red flags, dots, call them what you will, that could be pieced together in countless ways. If pieced together in the most alarming ways, the alarm bell would never stop ringing. Although the task of tactical warning has always run up against these formidable challenges, the scraps and fragments that intelligence collects often have enabled analysts to offer warning of a more strategic nature, that the terrorist threat from certain kinds of groups, or in certain countries or regions, or against certain categories of targets, or in response to certain kinds of events, is higher than it is elsewhere. The result has been a persistent pattern in the intelligence community's performance on this subject that has been noted, for example, in the findings of the investigation that was led by General Wayne Downing into the bombing of Cobar Towers in 1996. That pattern, an absence of tactical warning, but good strategic intelligence of the underlying terrorist threats, is what you get when earnest efforts are made to extract what can be extracted from this extremely hard intelligence target. Certainly, the intelligence community must spare no effort to obtain tactical intelligence on future terrorist attacks against U.S. interests. But years of experience teach us that even if high priority is given, as it has been, to the development of sources for that kind of very specific information. And even if considerable imagination and resources are applied to that task, truly well-placed sources inside terrorist groups, the kind that can yield plot-specific information, will always be rare. A corollary lesson is that the United States should avoid overly heavy reliance on intelligence to provide tactical warning. The panel that was chaired by retired Admiral William Crow that examined the embassy bombings in 1998 noted an unfortunate tendency among security managers towards such excessive reliance on tactical warning. Intelligence officers share a responsibility for countering that tendency by reminding consumers what we don't know as well as what we do. To borrow an advertising slogan, an educated consumer is our best customer. 
As important as tactical warning is, it represents only a fraction of what intelligence has contributed through the years to counterterrorism, including contributions that have saved lives. Strategic forms of intelligence can be, in fact, even more useful than the tactical as inputs to decisions to security countermeasures, many of which involve costly long-term programs to respond to continuing threats rather than to a single plot. One subject that received strategic attention from the intelligence community in the 1990s was threats to the U.S. homeland. The 1993 attack against the World Trade Center was certainly a key event. It did not generate anything close to the level of public attention and concern that we'd see eight years later. And that, of course, is the difference between an attack that kills six people and one that kills 3,000. But to intelligence community analysts, the larger threat to the homeland was apparent. The goal of the World Trade Center truck bombers in 93, after all, had been nothing less than to topple the Twin Towers and kill thousands in the process. The community's work on this subject over the next couple of years culminated in 1995 in a national intelligence estimate, the most formal and fully coordinated form of intelligence assessment, one that is personally approved by the DCI and heads of the community agencies. The sole subject of this estimate was foreign terrorist threats to the U.S. homeland. The FBI, along with CIA and other intelligence community agencies, participated fully in preparation of this estimate so that it would reflect the Bureau's information on the foreign terrorist presence in the U.S., as well as the intelligence available to CIA and others. This estimate, as was noted in one of your Joint Inquiry staff reports, addressed civil aviation as an attractive target that foreign terrorists might strike in the United States. This particular aspect of the estimate was the subject of subsequent efforts involving the DCI Counterterrorist Center, the FBI, the National Intelligence Council, and the FAA to sensitize relevant consumers to that particular threat. The FAA arranged, in fact, a set of special briefings for representatives of the aviation industry at which senior CIA and FBI counterterrorist specialists, like myself, presented much of the material in the estimate as part of an effort to persuade the industry of the need for additional counterterrorist security measures for domestic civil aviation. I might also add I was proud later on to participate in, along with my intelligence community and FBI colleagues in the work of the Gore Commission, which Mr. Free mentioned earlier. What is the lesson to be drawn from this episode, apart from the direct one that the intelligence community, or at least part of it, and the FBI were working closely with the relevant regulatory agency as early as the mid-1990s to call attention to the foreign terrorist threat to domestic civil aviation. Well, I think it is that we as a nation tend to be more willing to respond with expensive new security measures in response to past tragedies that have already occurred than to projections of threats that have not yet materialized. The intelligence community certainly has an important duty here. As any new intelligence analyst is taught, what matters is not just to make correct predictions and hit the right notes, which may look good in postmortems, but to beat the drum loudly enough about impending threats to have some chance of making an impact on policy. In this instance, perhaps the intelligence community could have beaten the drum even more loudly than it did, but it is tough to compete with what had been, up, right up until September 11th, many years of civil aviation operations in this country that had been virtually untouched by terrorism. The record of the U.S. intelligence community changing in response to the threat from international terrorism goes back farther than the end of the Cold War and back before the episodes, the cases that were examined by your staff, back to the 1980s when the main U.S. concern was with Hezbollah's activities in Lebanon, including the bombing of the embassy and the marine barracks and the years of hostage taking, as well as the terrorist activities of certain states. The community's principal response at that time, and in many ways still its most important response ever, was the creation of the DCI Counterterrorist Center, or CTC as it's called, in 1986. This step was a bureaucratic revolution. It involved slicing across long-standing lines on the organization chart, bringing analysts and operators to work more closely together than they ever had before, and benefiting from the synergy that comes from having people with different skills and specialties attacking the same high-priority problem together. 
Further refinements were made in CTC in subsequent years. One for which I'm proud to claim personal credit was the creation of a permanent cadre of counterterrorist analysts, replacing an earlier system in which the analysts working on counterterrorism were on loan from other offices, which continued to control their promotions and their careers. There were also reconfigurations within the center, including the special bin Laden unit, which you've already heard about from Ms. Hill and others. Another refinement in CTC was the increased representation of agencies other than CIA, particularly but not exclusively law enforcement agencies such as the FBI. Much has been written and said, uh, particularly over the past year, about the FBI-CIA relationship. I find elements of truth in much of this commentary, but I also find most of it dated. The relationship, although it had problems at the beginning of the 1990s, improved substantially during the course of the decade. This was partly due to a commitment at the top of each agency to make it work, and Director Free and Director Tennant both deserve a lot of credit for that. It was also due to other measures, such as the cross assignments of personnel that you've heard about from earlier witnesses. I would also add that the relationship uh, with the Southern District of New York, Ms. White's old office, uh, became, as she already noted in her testimony, particularly close on the bin Laden-related cases. Along with these changes involving personnel and organizations, CTC's methods and operational strategy also evolved. Efforts to recruit well-placed unilateral sources continue to have high priority, but CTC developed during the 1990s a strategy that recognized that although information about specific terrorist plots was rare, other information about suspected terrorists and their activities was more feasible to acquire. The strategy was to work with many foreign government partners, foreign police, intelligence, and security services, to disrupt terrorist cells using whatever information we could collect about them. Most terrorists commit other illegal activity besides terrorism, and this became the basis for numerous arrests, interrogations, and other disruption initiatives, some of which my co-panelist already referred to, somewhat akin to nailing Al Capone for tax evasion. This type of disruption work must continue, in my judgment, to be a major part of U.S. counterterrorist efforts. It is slow, it is incremental, it does not yield spectacular, highly visible successes, but I'm convinced that by impeding the operations of terrorists, it has prevented some attacks and saved some lives. The main lesson I hope the committees draw from this capsule history is that there already has been a long and substantial evolution of the Intelligence Committee's approach to tackling international terrorism. Most of the innovations worth trying have already been tried. I'm sure all of us in this room wish there were some one further change or set of changes that would give us assurance that something like September 11th would never happen again. But I am not aware of such a step that would provide that kind of assurance, and I don't believe there is one, even though there clearly is room and need for additional improvement as long as our counterterrorist batting average is anything less than 1,000, which means indefinitely. As we work to avoid recurrence of the sorts of errors and omissions that have received so much attention in the September 11th case, we should try not to reinvent wheels already invented, or even worse, to undo beneficial adjustments made in the past. We should also be careful not to give the American people any sense that with some new set of changes, the problem of international terrorism has somehow been solved. Mr. Chairman, my written statement discusses other topics you asked me to address, but let me wrap up by attempting to respond to your request for recommendations. I'll mention a few matters that I think of most direct concern to these committees while emphasizing that, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, even major new efforts or initiatives are apt to yield only modest results. First, it is vital to have sustained, underscore the word sustained, long-term public support for what the intelligence community needs to do in counterterrorism, with everything that implies regarding resources. The main impact that the various attacks on U.S. targets had on the work of the Counterterrorist Center over the past decade and a half was that those were the times when public interest in the subject spiked and resources went up. When public interest was lower, as time passed without a major attack, which was the case as the 80s moved into the early 90s, resources were much tighter. The vital, painstaking work of taking apart terrorist groups and terrorist infrastructures is long-term work and it cannot be done with the kinds of ups and downs and support that have occurred sometimes in the past. 
Second, we probably should try to make more extensive use of multiple sources of data, including non-traditional sources, to detect possible terrorist activity. And by this, I mean not just using watch lists and checking names while working on individual cases, although that is obviously very important, but rather a broader exploitation for intelligence purposes of such things as travel and immigration data and financial records. I've always thought that trying to do this involved immense practical difficulties, ranging from the use of multiple names to problems in getting some of the information from the private and public sources that own it. I still think it involves that. It would involve looking through huge haystacks with only a chance of finding a few needles. But the standards for return on investment in counterterrorism changed on 9-11, and perhaps this is an avenue that we need to explore further. Third, and this goes far beyond what the intelligence community itself can accomplish, we must nurture foreign relationships to get the cooperation of foreign governments that is so vital to a host of counterterrorist matters, especially including intelligence matters. Of course, we need to continue to make every effort to develop unilateral intelligence sources on this topic. But in counterterrorism, we will always be, for several geographic, cultural, and jurisdictional reasons, more dependent on our foreign partners than with just about any other intelligence topic I can think of. That is not a weakness. It is something to cultivate and exploit. We need our foreign partners for information, and we need them to carry out most of the arrests, the raids, the confiscations, the interrogations, and the renditions that are involved in dismantling terrorist groups. This means that we need to give them the incentives to cooperate, and if necessary, the assistance in developing the capabilities to do so. Finally, we should take a broad view of counterterrorism and recognize that how much future terrorism occurs against U.S. interests will depend not only on what is done by people at the CIA or the FBI who have counterterrorism as part of their titles. Counterterrorism involves not only learning the secrets of the next terrorist plot or erecting security measures around what we think is the next terrorist target. It also involves the motivations for groups to use terrorism and the conflicts and conditions that lead some people to join terrorist groups in the first place. Even though there will always be some, like bin Laden, who seem determined to do us harm regardless of motives or conditions. This broad view obviously gets into many foreign policy issues that go beyond the scope of this hearing. But the lesson for intelligence is that as more priority is given to particular counterterrorist accounts, we should not denude ourselves of coverage in other areas that not only are important in their own right, but that also bear on possible future terrorism. The intelligence community has an important responsibility not only to go after al-Qaeda or whatever is the current predominant terrorist threat, but to be aware early on of future or nascent terrorist threats, whatever form those threats might take and whatever ideologies they might espouse, and of the conditions that might lead such threats to emerge. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Those are